You are watching With a Cup of Tea, a production of This House of Books, an independent bookstore cooperative and tea shop in downtown Billings. Now, here's our show. All right. Well, I have here Keith McCafferty, and uh, you have a series of books. It's quite a thick series. I think we're actually and missing, missing one. And we're missing one, so yeah. it's even thicker. Yeah, this is your latest one, A Death in Eden, uh, and there are several books. How many did you say? Uh, well, seven, seven and I'm working on the eighth. So, okay. Seven published. Okay. And the books feature uh, fellow Sean Stranahan. Tell me about him. Well, I wanted to have my sort of protagonist not be from Montana, but be from somewhere else so that they could see the what I call the New West through... Uh, through fresh eyes from it from you know mm -hmm. and uh, so I have him coming from Massachusetts actually uh, and like many people in Montana is it's realistic because uh, not only is he a private detective but he's a watercolor artist and a fishing guide mm -hmm. and that's the way people are a lot of people are in Montana they'll have two or three jobs in order to get by mm -hmm. And the cast of characters around him were people I was hoping to, you know, I wanted to uh, amuse myself. And so they were people that I liked to, to hang out with, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it, does he have a background as a detective? Uh, yes. Background? Yes, okay. it is grandfather's law firm back in, uh, back in uh, Boston uh, area. Uh, so he'd done a little bit of that and, and put out his shingle more or less when he moved into his art studio, hoping that the Blue Ribbon investigations, that nobody would take him up on it. Um, but, uh, but they do, and of course, he gets in trouble as a result. Okay. Somebody who can, you know, step in shit in a one-horse pasture, as they say. <laughs> okay. This is the first one, I gather. The, the Royal Wolf Murders was the first book, yeah. It features a... Uh, a Royal Wolf Fly. A Royal Wolf Fly. A very famous cover. pattern. Originally, all my books were going to have uh, flies on the cover, but I think we decided sort of early on that we weren't, in, you know, we didn't want to just limit readership to uh, mm. to people who fished. Sure. Um, so now I'll, st I'll get the fly on the spine of the book, like, like there, and... Uh, so it's sort of my little trademark, and each year I'll tie a new pattern, fly pattern, and send it to the art illustrator, Jim Tierney, who will put it on the books. Yes, I, I, I just saw uh, the fly that you tied for this Right, it's spine. called The Usual Suspect. The Usual Suspect. Okay. And that's a real fly pattern made, uh, originating in Sweden. Oh, okay. Well, where do you get your ideas for the books? Well, a lot of times from 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 real life, you know, the, uh, the death in Eden, uh, the Smith River is a river that I floated and loved for 20 years, you know, or more, mm -hmm. or maybe 25 years. Um, Cold Hearted River, this is a very interesting one to me because uh, I used to uh, fish with Jack Hemingway, who was Ernest Hemingway's oldest son, and we would... Uh, uh, he, w we were both sort of colleagues at Field and Stream. We were both editors, oh. and I would meet him on the Thompson River in British Columbia, and we fished a run called the Graveyard. And one day, uh, he hooked a great big fish in the graveyard, and I went down and tailed it for him, which is the way you land it, and we let it go. And then we had a, some schnapps and hot chocolate that I always had in my vest in honor of my father. And uh, I'd known Jack for several years and fished with him a few occasions. I'd never once mentioned the name of his father because the last thing he wants to do, he once was said, you know, I spent the first half of my life being the son of a famous man and the second half being the father of famous daughters. But this time I did. I asked, well, do you think um, your dad would have liked this kind of fishing? By which I mean, you know, a strike a week and you know, count yourself as a su successful if you don't drown, very difficult river to wade. And he said, first thing he said was, well, my pa uh, papa always said that, I um, like to say that all true stories end in death. <laughs> I think he would have liked the idea of fishing in a graveyard, because the, gra the, the little crosses are right up the hill from you there. Mm -hmm. But the second thing he said was, uh, but you know, my father lost all interest in fishing 
for trout or fishing for steelhead or anything in fresh water with a fly rod when all of his ge good gear was uh, stolen in transit from uh, basically Florida to uh, Sun Valley mm -hmm. in Idaho. Uh, all of the steamer trunk containing all his, all his gear was stolen and uh, it had, he had a lot of sentimental value attached to it. And according to Jack, he never fished again, only one time, and that was for a photo opportunity. Mm -hmm. So, to make the long story short, that's what gave me the idea to write that story. Mm -hmm. Whatever happened to Ernest Hemingway's lost fishing trunk? Wow. And okay. uh, he did spend a, a lot of his time between the 1930 and 1940 uh, near Cook City, Montana. And uh, this is actually a shot taken from real life there. That's the pilot and mm -hmm. that's the index. Those are oh, the sure. Name. Uh, about eight miles east of uh, Cook City. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So, um, let me ask one more thing. All right. And then we'll wrap it up. Uh, you are turning out one of these a year, and uh -huh. that must take quite a bit of discipline. What's your process for writing these things? Fear. Fear, you know. that works. <laughs> <laughs> Guilt and fear. Um, I'm scared to death of letting anybody down, whether it's my wife or my children or uh, my publisher, Catherine Court, who's, who's also my editor. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what drives me forward more than any other thing. I'm not compelled to write these books, but now that I have, you know, contracts to do it, I don't. I, I want to do them well, and um, and I actually like the fact of you know like doing a book a year because it keeps you involved in the process and involved with other people in the publication process or promoting the books or whatever. If you spend two or three years between books. That's just way too much alone, time alone to be healthy, I think, and to let self-doubt, you know, cr creep in to the process. Because I always think mm -hmm. half the battle is just being able to ignore the voice in your ear telling you that you're getting too old or you can't do this or you can't do that, you know. <laughs> so do you write every day? I write, uh, well, I write every day except Sundays as a general rule. And I like to write early in the morning. And I'm one of those people that I'll write in the seat, in the, passenger seat of the car or I'll write at a little covered bridge um, over little Bridger Creek in Bozeman, a little hiking bridge you go to, I'll take a chair. Uh, I'll work early at a coffee shop. I'll work almost anywhere but home because it's just too empty and too quiet at home, even if you've got cats and dogs around. Mm. And I remember, you know, when does that... Uh, you know, empty nest syndrome kick in. It kicks in the day your youngest child leaves home. You go home, that house is big and it's too quiet. And I just I'll work anywhere but there. <laughs> so I'm taking it you're writing this out longhand. No. No? I started longhand. I, had, I went to manual typewriters. I go back a ways. Mm -hmm. When I first started uh, writing for Field and Stream, they still had some contributors who... Uh, who um, sent in longhand mm. stories. So I started with manual typewriter and I skipped the, um, the uh, electric typewriter stage and, and then I, now I work on you know, a laptop like the rest of the world does. Oh, okay, okay. So about how many hours a day do you work then? I'm good for right. about three and a half in the morning mm -hmm. and then sometimes I'll work in the afternoon. Uh, if I already have a book done and I'm in the process of rewriting it, then I can work longer. If I'm like have to invent the world each morning, is seems to take a lot out of me. And after three or three and a half hours, I, I'm not thinking too straight. How many draft? <laughs> how many drafts do you go through? That's really hard to say because I rewrite constantly as I go along, and because I, I don't really have a blueprint, but just sort of write. You know, I'm what my agent calls a muddler through. Or I begin at the beginning and sort of muddle my way to the end. Uh -huh. um, because of that, I'm constantly rewriting. So do I rewrite the book 10 times or 100 times? I'm not sure. But I'll rewrite the original draft. Once I get a down draft, I'll probably rewrite it four more times after that. Mm -hmm. So, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> well, it's thanks. hard, it's, hard. Yeah. It's, it's really hard work. I try to tell myself it isn't, you know, but it is.
<laughs> it is, I know. <laughs> Hardest work I've ever done. Well, thanks so much. Well, thank you very much, Mark. <laughs> All right. Okay. This has been a production of This House of Books. If you'd like to be a part of the cooperative, please visit thishouseofbooks.com slash get involved.